the Florida Writer Podcast, a discussion about writing and other things. Hello, and welcome to another edition of the Florida Writer Podcast with your host, Allison Nissen. And today I am lucky enough to be with Phyllis Walters. Phyllis, could you give us a 60 second elevator pitch about who you are and what you write? Yes, uh, I'm originally from Ohio and I was a forensic psychologist for many, many, many years, probably 40. And in that time, I was appointed to evaluate defendants uh, standing trial on murder, rape, and, and those kinds of heinous crimes. And so I retired and the, to the village of Florida and refired as an author of true crime novels, which I disguise. Well, Phyllis, I'm going to ask a really, really basic question. What is a forensic psychologist? A forensic psychologist is a licensed clinical psychologist who has a niche or in um, forensic psychology. When I was a girl, you became a nurse, a secretary, you know, or um, a teacher. So I became a teacher. But thereafter, I was enabled by good fortune and blessings to go on to graduate school and become a psychologist, primarily in private practice, but also an adjunct in uh, several of the Dayton, Ohio area universities. Well, there was no such thing as an internship in forensic psychology, but now there would be more advanced training. So we learn through continuing education and reading and those kinds of things and used our basic skills as well in terms of um, being clinical psychologists. So it has to do with the law. Um, most of what I did was actually in family practice, uh, doing uh, evaluations appointed by the court for the um, parental rights and responsibilities known as custody evaluations. But those lawyers in a small town also um, do criminal law. And so that's how they engaged me. They trusted me and they engaged me in evaluating their defendants um, both the prosecutor's office and the defendant's attorneys would uh, have me appointed by the judge to evaluate the defendant. So you would evaluate whether or not they could stand trial? Right. It might be competency to stand trial that would be an issue. Um, it might be sanity. It might be um, mental, mental, not capacity, but um, whether they were not um, schooled enough to um, assist, understand the charges, or, uh, you know, if they were handicapped, mentally handicapped in any way, um, things of that nature. So I did that. Oftentimes it was a second opinion. An agency might conduct the first evaluation and then someone would be disturbed by the um, recommendations and they would ask for a second evaluation. And that would be me. And that's why both sides ended up using me. And then they would hold their breath and hope that I would see it in, in the best interest of their position as prosecutor or as um, defense attorney. So that's what a forensic psychologist does. I, I did some civil cases. I did some probate cases, but primarily family and criminal law, of which my novels are based on the criminal cases. All right. I imagine some of those cases were really disturbing, juicy. I'm not sure what the right word would be for a writer. Well, they are. Um, everything happened in the Dayton, Ohio area, but I grew up in Toledo and I was there until after my PhD. So I moved all of them to Toledo, changed the names, changed some events. So I basically fictionalized a great deal, but I, everything was inspired by true cases. The Christmas Slangs was my first novel because she, this one girl, was on my mind for 25 years. And I decided that I wanted to um, write about her story. So she is in prison for life without parole and never held a weapon. She was with this small group. She made poor decisions. I'm not saying she was a nice girl, but she testified against the shooters and this was the deal. And I don't consider this much of a deal. 
when I asked her attorney why he agreed to this deal, he said, well, my job was to save her life. It took the death penalty off the table. Well, no jury would have proceeded to recommend the death penalty for this young 20 year old woman with my uh, testimony about her background and all the things that led her to be where she was. They killed six people the week before Christmas um, that year. And uh, so she was one. Well, so she was on my mind and I switched from writing Christian inspirational books to writing true crime. After I wrote the book, I had the opportunity to become her pen pal. I did not communicate with her until after I wrote the story, Disguised. So this past summer, I was able to visit her and she's 50 years old. She's been in there 30 years and I didn't recognize her, but I wouldn't have. And I said to her something about her appearance and she said, well, I had sandy brown hair till last week. I said, you did? She said, I splurged. So she has this short, dark hair, sort of a bob, sort of like your hair, Allison. And she, she said, and it included a shampoo. And I said, well, tell me, you mind me asking what it cost you to splurge? She said, $9. <laughs> she hasn't been out in the community in 30 years. I said, honey, you couldn't buy the dye today for $9. So the second book was Wives Who Kill. And it was a story of two wives. One wife shot her abusive husband. And there are a lot of different little um, additions that I implemented in that book that had to do with sex trafficking because it really um, enrages me. And that really did not happen. But I was able to say that her husband was also you know, a party to that. The second woman was suffocating her baby girls to protect them from sexual abuse like hers. So she was delusional. And she was an Air Force wife that was assigned to the base. So I didn't want to write anymore. My editor said, you have to write Husbands Who Kill. I said, I don't want to write Husbands Who Kill. She said, a series is three books. I said, well, I don't want to write Husbands Who Kill. I had compassion for all those women, but those men were ugly. She said, write it anyhow. So I did. And, in, and there, I soften these books. Number one, they're faith-based, where people will ask if God can forgive them, and, and they'll work with the chaplain, things of that nature. But um, number two, um, I just was so burned out, like you said, from those sad stories about those tragic stories about those women that I really didn't want to write it, but I did. So it, the first man really shot his father who was abusing his mother when he was 14. So he wasn't even a man. And then later um, he has a very terrible turn of events when he is released at the age of 21 from uh, aging out, as they say, in juvenile court, juvenile detention. So that I was done. Well, I'm in the Writers League of the Villages and we have 250 authors. And I've been in leadership in that position for several years. So I kept getting these notes, write kids who kill, write kids who kill. So I'm here to say in the spring, it will launch. I finished it last week and it's kids who kill. And so that's my journey. And I'm open to your questions. Well, the, the kids who kill, you know, I'm thinking of, is it the Mendez brothers that uh, killed their parents uh, a couple decades ago? Yeah, it's, <laughs> I can only imagine that the, the, yeah, living in that space to write those stories is a psychological experiment all on its own. Well, it's difficult to write the testimony of the family members at sentencing hearings. But on Christmas slings, all six different families were represented at the sentencing hearing where they came forward and said how painful and this and their loss was and how they hoped that these kids would fry, you know, things like that. I put it aside. It was my first novel. I didn't write for two weeks because it made me sick. <laughs> and I created it. It wasn't true. I mean, they did speak, but I wasn't in that hearing. I can't tell you what they said. I can surmise with such a tragic loss what you would say as a loved one. So that was that. But um, it, 
it, you know, I, I didn't start out to do this. And I think the Lord just kind of puts the thoughts and the words and everything um, into my soul and my mind. And then I just write. So I don't, I soften everything because I was widowed at 49. And I met by the, by the grace of this judge who introduced me to my now husband. We've been married 25 years. So I have our first six dates in the first book. And my name in the book is Dr. Rosie Klein. And my dog is Jocko. And my boyfriend is Bucky. So I soften everything. And there's no profanity um, and no um, sex in my books. And so my editor thinks they would sell more copy, you know, if I were to include those items, but it's just not what comes out of me. And so I know how things are going to end because I was there and it's true how they end, but I don't know the process until I start. So sometimes Bucky and I are doing interesting things and I have that in there. And then there are times when I put, because so many things happened over the years, I've been stalked, you know, I've been, um, um, accosted well, evaluating someone in prison. So I was able to put those little items about me. My office was robbed, you know, things like that into the novels. And it kind of um, takes the reader, the edge off the reader who is hearing about these sad stories. How does your expertise as a psychologist help you create believable characters? Um, I think my life's journey helped as much as my um, uh, clinical psychology background. I really marvel at these young women who can write when they have no life experiences, like I said, where I can pull in items and then create backstories and things about those things that really did happen in my life, generally professionally, but also personally. So being a clinical psychologist in terms of the direct examination of the client, that certainly would have, have um, been critical to being able to evaluate competency. And the, the fourth book, The Boy is Deaf. So I had to have uh, American Sign Language interpreters in all of the um, interviews with him. And so he was deaf. He went to an upscale uh, shopping center in Columbus, Ohio, and he stole a car from the parking garage. And guess what's in the glove compartment? This is true, ladies, our registration with our address. So he goes to her house to burglarize it but she was there, so he killed her. And he abducted her four-year-old son. Well, he left the little boy out almost immediately at a rest area on, on an interstate where he knew that the state highway patrol would take him home safely. So that's that. So obviously I, the attorney, I believe, the first attorney wanted me to say that he wasn't competent because the first attorney didn't wanna to have to take the time that it would take with someone signing everything his client would be saying to him. So then a private uh, attorney rather than a public defender was appointed by his father. And then um, it, was, it ran smoothly because he was very literate. He could read, he could write, uh, he just simply couldn't hear. So it was, he was perfectly competent and probably as the, as the father would say, the first lawyer didn't think he himself was competent to represent him. So. What advice would you give to people about developing characters? Uh, well, I think that you have to um, look at the character's history, not just where the character is at this moment in time. So if you're writing about a character who has committed a crime, then you really, I had to create childhoods about these people that would be credible to the reader about how they, their journey uh, resulted in 
this action or inaction, whatever it was that they took. And I didn't remember their childhoods. So it totally was created. Um, and then when you're talking about the character, you want to talk about, it's called show, not tell. So you want to show who the character is rather than doing a great deal of narration about the character. Um, I find that uh, like we have a class on Thursdays on Zoom and it's one of the master classes and we've taken 10 weeks with David Baldacci and James Patterson. And what I'm learning is how to write dialogue because that's how you see who the character is. So in developing a character, the dialogue that character has with others in the book will be um, really what grabs the reader about the character. Well, Phyllis Walters, how can people get in touch with you? How can they find your books? Um, they, I'm on Amazon. I'm on thewritersmall.com. And um, my email address is Phyllis Walters author at Gmail. So that's easy enough. They'll remember me because it's like Barbara, but she's rich. Phyllis Walters, all one, and author, all Phyllis Walters, author at gmail.com would be a Phyllis, great. Are you ready to switch to our rapid fire questions? Oh, sure. Let's do it. Do you have any books on your nightstand? Yes, I do. I have, um, it's called Ruth Drowned. And there's this lending library down the street in front of someone's house. And you just put a book in and take a book out. And this is some author, I don't know who to tell you right off the bat, but it's her first novel. And, and it's about a little girl. It's called Ruth Drowned. But so far, Ruth is perfectly alive and well telling her story. So I, I don't know if she drowned and came back or what it is. Well, that sounds interesting. And I also have the Bible because I start every day with scripture. I read from the Old Testament. I read from the New Testament. And I usually use a women's devotional Bible because then it has inserts of uh, great little excerpts that women have written where a verse has touched them. Do you have a favorite holiday? A favorite holiday. Holiday. Um, Yes, Christmas. Um, unfortunately, I my own sons are not in the area, so I wasn't able to spend any holiday time with them. But one's in Michigan, one's in Ohio, one's in California. But my husband's side of the family all followed us to Florida. So we have had a lovely time with the children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren on his side of the family. And the birth of Jesus is just always touching. And what is your next vacation? My next vac vacation is Hilton Head Island. <clears throat> we go there every year for a week at Mother's Day. Uh, since I'm not around my children at Mother's Day, so why stay home? So we have um, a week, uh, the second Sunday in May in Hilton Head. And that also inspires me to write because just sitting on a balcony, looking at the water or walking on the beach. And actually my um, Christian devotional novels, uh, they aren't novels, my Christian devotional books were written in that manner by sitting on the beach, walking on the beach. And... Well, Phyllis Walters, thank you so much for stopping by. Well, thank you, Allison, for your invitation. And I hope that I hear from those who um, might be interested in this podcast and have, have a blessed new year. You have been listening to another edition of the Florida Writer Podcast with your host, Allison Nissen. Allison out. Woo! We're all done. <laughs> well, thank you. That was fun. Phyllis Walters is a retired clinical psychologist from Ohio who currently lives in Florida. She has published three novels in the true crime genre. The first, The Christmas Slains, was published in December 2019. 
and is the story of a small gang and their victims. The gang terrorized a mid-sized Ohio town before Christmas 1992. She has also published two more true crime novels, Wives Who Kill and Husbands Who Kill. Her next book, Kids Who Kill, will be out shortly. For more information about Phyllis Walters, visit her on Amazon.com. For more information about the Florida Writers Association, visit us on the web at floridawriters.org. Until next time.